Linda, it's so great to have you here with us today. Um, these podcasts where I get to interview our new team members are so exciting for me. So thank you for joining. Well, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, you have a very interesting story. And it's something that, you know, we come across a lot at Mastering Diabetes. And so I think a lot of people are going to relate to what you're, what you've experienced. And I think they're going to learn a lot from you. So I'd love to just start from the top. Like, tell us how you were diagnosed with diabetes, your, your whole journey of like becoming, you know, uh, this amazing story that you have become and, and your desire to help people now. Okay. Well, it's really interesting that it's almost exactly 30 years ago, probably like in the next couple of weeks, that I was diagnosed with diabetes. So I, um, my mom had gestational diabetes with all four pregnancies, and um, she's not obese. She didn't have big babies or anything, but she had this um, gestational diabetes. So I was being treated as though I could have it. And I was tested and I ended up with my first pregnancy on insulin at 28 weeks. And so I can remember driving home from the clinic crying with my vials and my needles and my meal plan and having no idea. I mean, my mom was never treated like that. She just was told she had high blood sugar and told to watch what she ate. And so that was really a shock. But after the first two pregnancies, the diabetes went away. Okay. And it was fine after delivery. And then I had my third child, um, and it didn't leave. So I was told then that I had um, type 2 diabetes. And that would have been in 1998. And so I lived that way for many, many years. And what's interesting about diabetes is that it's invisible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not it, not if you're a type 1 Um but for a type two, it's totally invisible. So you can pretend for years that you don't have it and nothing really bad happens. Right. And so I went to my annual physicals. My blood sugar was always between 6.4 and 6.7 and it didn't really change that much. And um, I struggled a little bit with trying to get to my ideal weight. And so I was the person that was trying all the diets. Uh-huh. And before keto, there was Atkins and fat flush and protein sure. power. Sure. And the zone. And I don't know, however, many other ones. And I remember talking to my doctor about it once, saying none of these diets work for me. And she said that's because they have too much fat. Wow. So she at least knew that back then. Amazing. And yeah, interesting. And so um, I was really mostly struggling with my weight back in about 2012. And my husband was too. And so he brought home a set of books by Dr. Joel Furman. Um, They were called Eat for Health, and I had never heard of a plant-based diet. And and when I was in college, my my roommates called me Uncle Linda because I ate like their uncles. So I grew up eating meat and potatoes, Uh Minnesota girl. And so this was like a whole new thing, and I had never heard of any of the vegetables, kale, collards, any of the greens or anything. I had never really eaten fresh vegetables. Wow. We always had canned stuff. And so it was totally different for me. And um, I, But I had some good success. I lost some weight in my A1C drop to 5.8, but never lower than that. And so, um, and I transitioned slowly over years, I guess, um, up to a plant-based diet. And then it started to bother me that I couldn't really get my um, A1C better. And I had... Um, eventually found the Food Revolution Summit, which is ongoing right now, and um, heard about you guys in 2017. And so I joined your program, and and it was you must have had just a large group then, and I remember a conversation we had on the phone. You were the first person that told me that I could eat fruit, and that would help my diabetes, which I thought was very strange. (laughs) So I did the program, but I did not improve. I didn't get worse, but I didn't improve because my A1C was already in that 5.8-ish range. And I had asked my doctor to get a C-peptide. And she said no, because they don't use that test. It was out of date and it didn't make sense to do it. And so I sort of believed her. Mm -hmm. And 
then the more I, you know, started learning, I got, I started becoming desperate for health. I got super interested in, you know, reading every possible book on nutrition, plant-based eating. And I um, heard about fasting as a way to reverse diabetes. So I contacted True North and I eventually did a, an 18 day fast at True North. And they were very confident that my diabetes would resolve. And it did not. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Linda, this is great. There's so much good stuff here. I, I got to pause for a second. Okay. So um, you initially, like, how much overweight were you? Like when you were originally? At the, the at my most overweight, I was about 25 pounds overweight. But okay. I'm a small person. Yeah, so yeah. I never I was, imagined you as being like super overweight. So no. And and your when your mom had gestational diabetes four times, she wasn't really overweight either. She's not overweight at all. She's the same as me, five foot two, 110 pounds, right. you know. And then we have all these obese people in the family that don't have diabetes. So right. Very and so. Curious. Yeah, it's, that's very interesting. But a lot of there are there's a lot of obese people in the country in the world who don't have diabetes, which mm -hmm. is a different story for a different podcast. But what I'm, I just want to point out here, because this is a, an important thing for people to understand, is that there's this idea, and we're going to move into you know the type of diabetes you have, and we'll get into those details. But the fact that sometimes you know people who are thin uh, are not like you know dramatically overweight or certainly not obese, um, I get diagnosed with diabetes. And, and that's very confusing for a lot of people. And there are people out there who, again, like have a confusing diagnosis. They hear things, you know, from us about, hey, eat more fruit and you're gonna get better. And sometimes they don't. And, and like, wait a minute, what's going on? And there's an explanation. And then also like, I mean, I wanna give you know, kudos to you for your commitment to everything you've done, like every step of the way. It's okay, I learned this, I learned this, now I'm gonna go do an 18 day water fast. <laughs> I mean, people listening might be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, are these guys serious? Like. Water fasting is actually great. Uh, again, that's another podcast for another day. We have done some episodes on that. But uh, if you want to learn more, you can go to the you know, True North. But um, 18 days. Okay, so what happens on the fast now? So on the fast, I found out that I actually couldn't fast. Mm -hmm. So I get there, and I had had times where I had tried fasting for a day or so at home and noticed that I had symptoms of hypoglycemia, which I remembered from being on insulin. And so when I started the fast, I said, I'm a little nervous about this. I'd like to have my blood sugar checked. And so they give you a phone. You can call 24 hours a day. And if you call somebody, they are like there in like two mm. minutes with a glass of juice for you. Mm. And so they check my blood sugar and I'm down to, you know, in the 30s. Wow. And wow. so I had to fast on um, 300 calories of juice a day. Okay. And, in, you know, in addition to water. And at the end of the fast, I asked the doctor, what is this? And he said, I would recommend you visiting a pediatric endocrinologist. Hmm. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I'm sure he knew exactly what I had, but he didn't say the word out loud. Um, but uh, the other thing I want to mention is that you get so ridiculously desperate when you hmm. get a diagnosis, especially if you get a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, because it's supposed to be a lifestyle disease. Right. And we're supposed to be able to reverse this, and it's supposed to be caused by being overweight. And I have read that it, even slightly overweight can um, cause it. And so, you know, you become somewhat crazy. And it uh, and the behavior of the restricting food, so mm. that you know, I'm eating only beans and greens basically, and doing all this crazy stuff to try to reverse the diabetes. And we get a little bit crazy and there's a lot of like shame and guilt involved mm -hmm. if we can't improve. Yes. And yes. that's kind of where I was at. And, mm -hmm. and I had decided I'm gonna do everything I can. I'm not gonna go on any medication or anything until I know that there's nothing more I can do. Cause my mm -hmm. doctor had been trying to get me on insulin for years and I just stubbornly refused. Uh -huh. And so after the fast, I didn't go to see a pediatric endocrinologist. I did another program, um, um, and they had me do some testing. And at that time, I found out I did have a low C-peptide. Um, and when I started their program, it was a 0.6. And by the end of their program, it was a 0.26. Wow. And um, they had me doing an even crazier diet where it was basically just greens and a couple tablespoons of beans. And I got down to 97 pounds mm. and my diabetes did not improve. 
Mm -hmm. The 97s is, is, is very low for you. Yes, yes. Very low for almost anybody. But you're yeah. a small person. Yes, but it was like scary small where I had people telling me I had an eating disorder. And yeah. I was just like, I'm just trying this for three months. I'm listening. Yeah. I'm going to do whatever they say. And then I'm going to be done. And I'm going to go on insulin. So yeah, I did. And yeah. And so um, I just want to take a moment for anybody who's listening who's not familiar with the C-peptide test. It is what we label as the most important test for diabetes. And really, really no matter what diagnosis you have, it's, it's good to get your C-peptide just to be aware of it. I mean, I'm living with type 1 diabetes. I still found it interesting to get my C-peptide tested. It's less than 0.01. So basically meaning I have an undetectable amount but of insulin being produced. So C-peptide test is a surrogate for how much insulin is your pancreas producing. C-peptide and insulin are produced in a one-to-one -one ratio. They break off, insulin does its thing, C-peptide sort of floats around, and it's easier to test. And it's really sad that a lot of doctors won't order this test. It's not even very expensive. It's not, it's not hard to order. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate, but you did get that test and you found out that you had a, a very low C-peptide, meaning your body's not producing a sufficient amount of insulin. So what happens next? So then I decided I'm going to go on insulin and I went to see my doctor and I asked her to put me on insulin and at the very same time I contacted Mastering Diabetes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I joined as a private client and so I had Coach Adam coach me for about four months, four to five months and I was already eating 100% plant-based, salt, oil and sugar-free so that part I didn't need help with. All I needed to know was how to do a decision tree. Mm -hmm. and how to dose the insulin with the basal and the bolus doses and stuff. And so it was so transformative uh, it, and so empowering because then I am finally eating food again, you mm -hmm. know? So yeah. that's when I started eating great big, huge, uh, giant green smoothie bowls in the morning with all these mangoes and bananas and everything in them and really enjoying food and feeling like I can become in control of my diabetes. And by then I had started wearing uh, a continuous glucose monitor. And that was really a game changing thing too. And I had, I had never seen one until I was out at True North and I met somebody that was wearing one. And so um, that, was, that was the start of when I wanted to be a health coach then. And so um, two years ago, uh, at one of my meetings, I have it written in my notebook, ask Adam how to become a health coach. Mm. And so I did, and he gave me some options of places that he knew of that people get trained as a health coach. And he okay. said to me, it would be so powerful to have a, um, some an insulin-dependent um, person on our staff who is a mm -hmm. woman, because at that time we didn't have Wendy and Sharon on the team. So Yeah. 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 Okay. We're going to talk a lot more about this because I'm very intrigued to learn a lot of the details myself. But let's take a step back. What did you have to go through mentally to make that choice to start using insulin? Yeah, well, I think you first of all have to get through the stages of grief of um, this can't be true. You know, there's got to be something else. And I think I was I have been going through that before I got the C-peptide test. The C-peptide test was the final piece of the puzzle. Well, one of the final pieces of the puzzle for me in terms of is there anything else that I can do and is it my fault? So, I mean, there is that. Um, did I cause this? I ruined my pancreas by the way I was living. And you have to at some point then let it go. And um, so for me, I felt like I had fully exhausted all measures. I had been eating clean for years. I had tried the fast. I had tried all these other programs, and I knew that there was really nothing more that I can do. And so having that level of acceptance then somehow became a, a path to freedom in some strange way where finally saying yes to insulin said also, also said yes to life in a sense because then I wasn't restricting my food anymore. And I wasn't, you know, like jumping on my trampoline after eating in a crazy way, trying to get my blood sugar down after eating. And um, so it, it's just it's just a process, though, because it is like, what does this mean? And there's all this um, this confusion about will I ever be able to eat again? Will I have to change my food and stuff? I didn't have that so much because I had been on insulin so many years ago, 20 years past. And I was 
the only thing I was concerned about was the needles and the vials. And so I was super happy to find out that they have these little ultra fine short needles uh -huh. yep. put on the on the pens. And so it's really not a big deal at all. But it is a it's an emotional thing that you have to really get through and you just have to come to terms and accept the fact that there's nothing more you can do. Um, I was talking to one of our members a few weeks ago. I joined um, a private session to talk about what happens when you have a low C peptide. And, and she had a lot of the same behaviors that I was doing and I could relate, you know, and she really doesn't want to go on insulin. And, um, but she's sitting there wearing a pair of glasses. And I said, you know, was it hard for you to get a pair of glasses? And she said, no. And I said, this is the exact same thing. This is just your eyes don't function as they were intended to. And you're just putting on glasses. Like there's no, there doesn't need to be a big emotional connection to it. It's just a tool to fix something that is, you know, broken in our bodies. And that's I mean, a, that's, that's a great way to put it. What was the official diagnosis that you ended up receiving? Well, I didn't find that out till one more year. So I had, um, I went to see, I asked my doctor, what is it that I have? And she said, I don't know. I'm going to send you to an endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. And he immediately said, I think you have Modi, mm -hmm. uh, which is monogenic diabetes of the young and requires genetic testing and genetic counseling, which I was able to get. And I um, technically have GCK Modi, which is Modi type two. And there are about 14 different types of Modi that have been identified so far. And, um, I just got a, a private client last week that has Modi 12. So wow. yeah, it's really interesting. There's more types coming all along. And basically GCK Modi is that, um, the GCK gene functions as an internal blood sugar monitor. And mine is somewhat defective, and so it, I have a higher um, baseline setting for when my body would secrete insulin. Mm -hmm. And um, so you end up running a little bit high on your um, fasting blood sugar and generally a little bit high with your um, A1C. In most cases, it doesn't result in a low C-peptide. So I still don't know why that happened, but yeah. it and did. Did they ever test antibodies? I've had three of the antibodies tested. I've been thinking about doing that again. Mm -hmm. So um, just to find out if I think the zinc transporter, I haven't had that one tested. Right. Some are harder to get tested than others. Yeah. So and now essentially, that, like you said, there's so many different types of Modi. But, you know, mm -hmm. based on, you know, we can have data of what you're experiencing when you eat food. We can get the C-peptide data. But essentially, you are actively treating it as type 1.5 is that accurate yes because at this point i have very low pancreas function so i'm right. making very little insulin yeah that's right okay and talk to us a little bit about you know how much insulin you need to use as you know a person living with this type of diabetes mm -hmm. i use about 18 to 20 units a day mm -hmm. um, i eat about 350-ish grams of carb a day, maybe. Um, so I take Lantus at night. You're smiling. I have. I take about uh, eight units at night and then, you know, three your, to five insulin units. Insulin sensitivity is very good, Linda. Yeah. Well, I work here, uh -huh. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, It's and it's not a big deal, you know, at all. You just mm -hmm. make sure you have a pen with you and otherwise you're eating salad for yeah. dinner. Okay, are you using Lantus, and what's the fast-acting insulin? Uh, Novolog. Novolog. Okay. Wonderful yeah. combination. So, and just for anybody listening, like we love the details here at Mastering Diabetes, but for when it comes to long-acting insulin, it's best to use one that works for 24 hours. So um, a lot of people are on Levomir, and Levomir is just a disaster. It's so hard to manage your blood glucose when you're using Levomir because it works for like roughly 17 hours, but Lantus, Basilar... Traceba, Tugeo, um, those are the best long-acting insulins that work for 24 hours. So, um, and talk to us a little bit about your experience with the, uh, the CGM that you wear. How, how has that helped you? Well, that has been really interesting. So I started out wearing a Freestyle Libre, and that was before they had the Libre 2, so it didn't have alarms on it. And I wore that up to about three weeks ago, so um, almost three years. 
Mm -hmm. And especially if you have a low C-peptide, even if you don't want to go on insulin or don't want to be on any meds, watching that blood sugar rise and seeing how high you go after meals is super informative and would be very helpful to bring to doctor's appointments. So when I go see the doctor, you know, I connect my data to them and they read it and he says, you're doing amazing. Um, And I just switched now a few weeks ago to Dexcom, which is outrageously expensive. I paid $1,500 out of pocket for three months for it Yeah. Um, compared to I was paying about $70 a month for the Freestyle Libre. But I wanted the alarms. I was having a lot of problems with lows mm-hmm. yeah. and was afraid to go to bed at night if I was over 100. And so um, that has really been awesome. So I was my time and range was at about um, it used to be about 80, 85 percent when I wore the Libre. But since I started on the Dexcom for the last two weeks, it's been 96%. Look at you, Linda. I love it. <laughs> so, I, love it. And- I know. It's really been helpful. And I have it set so that it goes, it beeps at me if, it, if I go to 75. Mm-hmm. And that keeps me up from crashing because I have that tendency, which I yeah. think is part of my Modi, is mm-hmm. that I have this, um, the internal blood sugar monitor is not, functioning yeah. properly and so my liver doesn't always kick in and send me a little sugar when i need it that's right and again i'm glad you're talking about this nuance detail that's uh, that happens for you and then this is something we see in the coaching program like everybody's diabetes is a little bit different it's a little bit and like you know how what time of day somebody's more insulin sensitive what time of day they're more insulin resistant you know for me in the morning like it just takes longer for the insulin mm-hmm. to work you know, and we, we, we find that pretty consistently, but not for everybody. And then the afternoon is like, how long do you wait to eat? And like, this is the stuff we find out through the coaching process, through the decision trees. That's why we're all so passionate about this. So I'm glad, you know, you're, you're bringing that up and, and sharing that. Um, but just to get back to a couple of the CGM details, what range do you have set? So that's when you're saying you're 85%, is that 70 to 180 or, or, or is it? Yeah, something? I have it set at 70 to 180. Good. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, good. That's what I like. Because so what happens is people talk about time and range, and then sometimes it's like, oh, what's your range? You know, you, we have to define that. So mm-hmm. that is that is the standard. That's how it should be when you want to consistently talk about time and range. So that's good. Now, um, another thing I want to talk about here is you brought up the fact that you have your alarms set at a certain, you know, certain way. So you put it at 75, so it kind of like basically beeps you before you get to 70. And this is something I love to talk about because when you're using a CGM, it's a tool. It's, it's an opportunity to improve your overall blood glucose control, to improve your overall A1C, and we can use those alarms to our advantage. So for me, I have the high beep at me at, around, at 150. So if I'm, if I'm above 150, it's like, okay, it's time to take action, and that will prevent me likely from ever getting to 180. I have the lows beep at me right now. I have it set at 80. So if, if I'm 80, it's like, okay, I, gotta, I should probably potentially do something, depending on the arrow, right? I mean, if it's flat, I might do nothing. If it's going down, I would probably like, you know, let's have a date or half a date or something. So um, I'm just glad to see that you're you're using the device in, in the way that helps you and works for you. Yeah. And since I started getting these beeps, I have stopped having the, the, the reactive hyperglycemia. So I go low, then I um, eat something and then I'd be up in the 250s. Mm. You know, and then hanging out there because it's hard for me to come back down. And so I have stopped that pattern, which is really common, I guess, with one type 1.5s where you're going up really high and then back down and up really high and back down. So that is all really leveled off since I've started using the um, alarms, which has been really good. That's great. And yes, you're right. There are some nuanced challenges with type 1.5. Some people don't need basal right away because it depends on where their C-peptide is at and they just need a little bit of fast acting. But even sometimes like a half a unit for some people can be like too much, especially mm-hmm. when they become more insulin sensitive on our program and they're producing a plenty of their own insulin. So it becomes an interesting game of uh, how to figure that out. And, and again, we do that through like, you know, decision trees and, and consistent conversations. So, mm-hmm. okay, Linda, so you have this experience, you learn a lot working with Adam and this leads you to decide that you also want to become a health coach. Yes. So I had already retired way, really young. I was in my um, early 50s. I had retired from corporate finance. I had done um, 
a lot of work um, for big corporations and I was just tired of working so much and of missing my kids when they were at things. And so I had retired and I was like a full-time volunteer doing all kinds of volunteer work. Um, I was doing strategic planning for nonprofits and all this other stuff. And it was really fun, uh, but I was always talking to people about health, always trying to help them convert to a plant-based diet plant-based evangelist and then you know once I started talking with Adam and I had already decided I was going to go back to work um, a couple of years ago and so I was doing some soul searching at the very same time that the pandemic hit and that was right when I was coaching with Adam I was doing a kind of a life workshop um, and you come up with two words that define the call on your life and my two words are mobilizing movement and so that's what I feel like I'm called to do is help people move. Um, yesterday, it was literally I helped my son move into his brand new first house. But a lot of it is helping people move forward when they're stuck. And so I, I was doing that when I was working, when I was a leader, when I did business um, consulting and coaching. I do that with organizations that I've um, consulted with. And I feel like I do that with people and food. And so I decided I'm going back to school. So I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and studied and then um, did another course through them and then was able to sit for the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches exam, which was last October. And as soon as I got the results back, which was in December, I went on the Mastering Diabetes website and lo and behold, you were hiring. And so I filled out a form and long application and sent it in and um, got contacted in early January about interviewing. So this was the goal all along that I wanted to come and work here. So here I am. And we are so glad to have you. And we already have people raving about uh, working with you. So it's, it's really exciting to have you uh, as part of the team. And, you know, it's something we're really passionate about like with our our coaches here like every coach and you you know this as well as i do working with them on a regular basis like everybody here is passionate about this lifestyle they mm -hmm. have they're living it themselves they're really not we're not asking our our members our community to do anything that like we're not basically all doing ourselves and mm -hmm. um and we really when people come in whether they get grouped into you know uh, their small group coaching or private coaching we put them oftentimes with a coach has a very similar experience to them. So, you know, you're working with type 1.5 with Modi, um, mm -hmm. insulin dependent in general. Um, and it's great to be in, not just in the community of people who also have a similar type of diabetes, but also a coach who really understands. So, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's really, really fun to be able to talk to people. Um, I had never actually spoken to anybody until this week that had Modi. Mm. And when I got off the phone with her, it was her first private coaching session. She said, I finally have hope. I have you. I look mm. at you. You're healthy. Yes. And that's what I want to be. I so love that. I love energy that. and health. Yeah. She said, uh -huh. you're my role model. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fantastic. You're leading by example. Yes. And everybody really honest to God is. We send pictures of fruit to each other. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> our our internal communication at the company amongst each other is like really fun. It really is. Yeah. Um, what's been what's been your favorite part about you know working with this mastering diabetes team? Well, I, you kind of already said what one of my favorite things is is that the team really lives it out, and mm -hmm. so being part of a family of people that are all living a plant based lifestyle and they're all exercising, everybody's healthy. The relationships are healthy so that's super fun but the members are amazing and so that's one thing i really learned is that i tried to do this whole thing alone so i didn't i don't like group things in general i'm kind of a um, introverted person and i wanted to do it alone i didn't i i didn't understand till i got here that um there are all these insulin dependent people i had never actually talked to anybody about being insulin dependent or how much insulin I use or anything. Yeah. And so that has been a, a really huge blessing. But the other thing is the, I have been blown away by the support that's been handed out to each and every uh, member that we have by the other group members and mm -hmm. people in the Facebook group, they're uh, cheering each other on. 
because people, you know, you have um, challenges and you have successes and people are really there for each other. And that um, has really, really impressed me. It's like we, ha we hold really sacred space for people mm -hmm. to work through the challenges of being diagnosed, maybe having to go on insulin, mm -hmm. the ups and downs of trying to change habits that they've had for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It really is remarkable, the support that's handed out to each and every person here. Yeah, I, I love the word you use there. You said a sacred space. I, I think that's beautiful. And, you know, maybe another way to say it would be it's a safe space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that Facebook group for our members, um, it's a place where people understand, you know, and it's okay to like share and express the challenges. Um, you know, a lot of people have, you know, they end up finding mastering diabetes when they're really at their wits end. Like they've tried a lot of things. Yeah. Um, it's been frustrating. And, and a lot of people, I, I mean, are scared. Like they're scared. Like, okay, kill, can I do this? Um, I've tried so many things. It hasn't worked. Uh, you know, is this, is this really going to last for me? And it's something we are, as you know, Linda, like we talk about repeatedly. It's like long-term success, long-term success. Take this slow, take it steady. And, you know, when you're doing a program that actually is providing your tissues and your cells with what the nutrition it needs, that is going to lend to something that's going to stick and, and going to last. And you're finally, you know, giving your, your body the glucose it needs because you're not avoiding these foods. Um, it's just one aspect of, of why, why it works long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing is you fall in love with uh, living this sort of a lifestyle. So like I never exercised before. I never had energy to exercise. I was always a little overweight. I wasn't good at exercising. And now I know that exercise acts like a sponge. Mm. And so I exercise, I can eat. And so like I like and I like to eat. And so now all of a sudden I'm up in the morning and I'm exercising every morning and it's like a privilege. It's a blessing and it's not a chore anymore. And so everything sort of turns on its head mm -hmm. and it's easy to, to maintain your weight. You know, mm -hmm. you're eating all these greens and healthy foods, these low calorie dense foods, and I'm not working at that anymore. You know, like that, that's not an issue anymore. And so then I'm approaching 60. I'm at my ideal weight. I have no aches and pains. I have no, um, no high blood pressure, no heart disease, no nothing. And that is, I can't say the same for a lot of other people. And so then the lifestyle becomes very um, self-reinforcing, I guess, yeah. when you get to that point and it becomes very pleasant and I cannot ever see going back. That's, that's beautiful. And I love that we're talking about with the sponge <clears throat> and it's like, it's a cycle, you know, the sponge, then you know, it, it, all the, the energy you then have, you now you want to go expend it and just like keep mm -hmm. on going. And it's a beautiful thing to, to feel good. Um, okay, so last question I have for you, Linda, is I would love to know what is your your favorite recipe, like your go-to recipe that you eat all the time and you just love it? Well, my go-to recipe is what I eat every morning for breakfast. It's two frozen bananas, two cups of frozen mangoes, and as much spinach or power greens as I can shove into a 12-cup um, Cuisinart food processor, and I grind that up into ice cream and then I top it with a tablespoon of flaxseed. So I get Amazing. ice cream every morning for breakfast. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't know I'd ever be able to do that. That is like the perfect breakfast right there. That is amazing. That's, that's fantastic. And I yeah. like that because also everything you just listed, like I'm just imagining like you like making that recipe. I'm like, wow, like that's super easy and super fast because yeah. those ingredients are easy to find. They don't go bad. They're both frozen. The mm -hmm. greens, they usually come in like a pre-cleaned package. I've yeah. been buying you know, like the organic girl, uh, super greens. I've been buying those a lot lately. Um, and like, and then the, the chia seeds, that's easy. It's just like, that's a super yeah. easy recipe. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's the same every day. So, and if you need to take it, like I'm going um, away this weekend, you can make it ahead, put it in a plastic bag and freeze them, stick them in a cooler with some ice. And then you have them, you know, open up each plastic bag and you've got your day's food and you're not relying mm -hmm. on somebody to serve you something that's going to be unhealthy. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Well, Linda, this has been great. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for being an incredible example. And, um, 
you know, you've, you've, you're on our team now, you've been through some training and now you're working with clients and, and the feedback we're getting is just extraordinary, which is amazing. And I hope people listen to this and <clears throat> want to uh, come and work with you. So um, I just really, really grateful to have you on the team. Thank you. I am absolutely thrilled to be here, honestly. <laughs>